All right. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Eleanor Rangers. I'm the president of the Southeastern Pennsylvania Cold War Historical Society. Um, we are a 501c3 organization that's been in existence since 2010. Our primary remit has been collecting oral histories of people who were involved in Cold War related activities uh, in the Southeastern PA area. But we have uh, somewhat extended our, our remit and are involved with historical preservation of uh, the old Naval, Naval Air Development Center, uh, as well as uh, centrifuge archives as well. So if you'd like to learn more about our organization, definitely check out our website at coldwarhistory.org. Um, I would kindly request that uh, once we start the presentation, if you could uh, mute your lines and turn off your cameras just to preserve band bandwidth. Um, but then certainly once we have Q&A, you can uh, certainly unmute and, and come back on, uh, on in view. Uh, this is our ongoing History in Our Backyard webinar series, um, where we have monthly lectures on Cold War related topics um, that we have been actually doing um, since June of 2020 when the um, pandemic started. We were previously doing these live and I'm hoping someday to get back to doing some selected live programming. But for now, um, we've been engaging with webinars and being able to do them on a monthly basis. So thank you for attending this evening. <clears throat> I do wanna mention for those on the line who may have worked at the Naval Air Development Center, we are in the process of planning a, an informal reunion um, on August 21st right now at the old Johnsville Centrifuge at the Fuge, which is an event center now. Um, however, we, we haven't received a lot of RSVPs. So we're kind of starting to toy with the idea that maybe moving it to early to mid-September may be better. So uh, please stay tuned for, for more information on that. If you are interested in attending and you were a former, um, former uh, employee of NADC or of the contractors that, uh, that worked uh, and supplied NADC, um, please definitely respond. You could, you could send our organization an email or if you're on uh, Doug Crompton's listserv, definitely uh, send an RSVP there as well so we can continue to tally responses. But uh, thank you for that. Um, I do wanna give just the usual plug as a 501c3 organization, we certainly operate on a shoestring. And um, if you so choose to make a donation to our organization, it is always welcome and it is always put to good use. One uh, thing that we will be applying some funds towards is the development of a display room that will be dedicated to the history of the Naval Air Development Center. This was a, a small room just off the front entrance of the centrifuge that was recently um, given to our organization by the building owner. Uh, so we are in the process of starting to uh, think about uh, displays. One of the first displays that I think we'll be focusing on is the P3 Orion program. Uh, and uh, I'm starting to begin to gather uh, some ideas for what that display will ultimately look like. But there will be other displays in that room as well, including some on a rotational basis. If any of you from NEDC are interested in uh, helping out with that, I would certainly welcome the help <laughs> and the expertise. So please feel free to reach out to our organization and I can uh, touch base with you. Um, we have been uh, utilizing a new system to send out our announcements for these webinars. If you're not receiving those uh, and would like to get on the email list, please send our organization an email. Or if you are on the email list and not receiving those emails, check your junk folder and, and spam filters. Sometimes that can get, uh, get filtered out. Also wanted to remind you that we do have a YouTube channel uh, under our organization's name. We you know, I do try to add content there fairly regularly. We also archive our webinars that are recorded. Um, so it is a place to view those if you don't have a chance to make one of these monthly sessions. So definitely would like to encourage you to check out our YouTube channel. And we also have a Facebook site if you are on that social media platform. Um, feel free to check that out as well. Um, I have recently added a feed for Facebook on our website. So that's another way of being able to see some of the postings that we put there um, as well. Um, this is a list of our ongoing 2022 programming. Um, as you can see this evening, John Ramirez, who we'll in introduce in a moment, will be speaking. But uh, next month, 
we actually have Greg Kennedy returning to talk about the corporal missile. So looking forward to that. Uh, and then we'll be rounding out the year with uh, some other interesting presentations. Uh, culminating with a, a presentation on TACAMO, which of course was a program uh, certainly run out of uh, NADC as well. So uh, lots to look forward to, and I'm already already got a queue for 2023. So we'll be unveiling that probably mid fall. So again, just a reminder: if you could please mute and uh, turn off your cameras for the presentation, I would really appreciate it. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and briefly introduce our guest speaker this evening, John Ramirez. So John is a former CIA officer who worked for 25 years in the intelligence community and served with the Directorate of Science and Technology, the Director of Intelligence and the National Counterproliferation Center. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to John to uh, go over some very interesting information about an, a Cold War association with Happy Valley State College, Penn State, however you wanna call it. So I'm gonna go ahead and unshare my screen and turn things over to John. So thank you, John. Just give me a moment here. There we go. All right, over to you. Okay. Yeah, and apologies to those that were sitting in queue while we were making our introductory remarks, but hopefully everybody's in now. All right, well, let's get I'm started. Sorry for people that were waiting in the queue while we were making the introductory remarks. Apparently, we missed the introductions. Okay, should I wait, uh, Eleanor, a little bit? Uh, no, I don't think so. We can go ahead. Okay. I, I'm just going to make sure everybody's lines are muted. Probably didn't do something. All right, we're good, John. Okay, uh, Eleanor, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. And again, I'm John Ramirez. I worked for 25 years at CIA and with the Office of Director of National Intelligence. And we're going to talk about a company called HRB, uh, which uh, still is located in State College, Pennsylvania, under a different name. And we're going to go review the history of this company and its contributions to winning the Cold War. And as a CIA officer, I am obligated uh, by regulation to show this statement that CIA actually has reviewed my slide presentation you're about to see and deemed it to be unclassified in its entirety. A little bit about my background, I was mostly in the technical intelligence area of CIA with the Director of Science and Technology and with Weapons Intelligence Analysis um, with the Director of Intelligence and served uh, with the National Counterproliferation Center um, in the ODNI, uh, which was mostly focused on uh, weapons of mass destruction. I'm also a Navy veteran. I was an electronics warfare technician serving on board uh, two ships, one out of Pearl Harbor and one out of Norfolk. Uh, we're gonna look about uh, HRB history, some of its accomplishments the very important analog to digital era, uh, which went from airborne to space-based, and uh, look at a few distinguished HRB employees that you may not know were associated with this company. So HRB uh, actually stood for the last names of its founders, George Haller, Richard Raymond, and Walter Brown. Uh, they were associated with Penn State University and have served in various capacities with technical um, developments in the um, military during World War II. And after World War II, they were working on a mapping project for the um, Army Air Force, which was the Air Force before uh, the department was set up in 1947. Uh, much like early companies uh, of that era, it started out with a house trailer and later to a garage. So HRB was a garage company and it eventually consolidated uh, at a um, street called Science Park Road on the outskirts of uh, State College. Uh, a little trivia for HRB, it was the first municipal cable TV company. Uh, they set up a large antenna on top of Mount Nittany and they strung cables into town for their subscribers. So they're delivering cable TV before anyone else had cable TV. 
Uh, right after uh, its founding in 1953, uh, Richard Raymond joined the RAND Corporation, that's Research and Development Corporation. It's known as a federally funded research and development center uh, working with the government. Uh, Walter Brown unfortunately died in 1955 and George Haller joined General Electric the same year. Uh, during the course of the early part of its history, they established offices in San Diego. No surprise there, that's where the Navy was at. Washington, D.C., the center of federal government and here in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, some of its uh, corporate acquisition history. In 1958, it was uh, acquired by a company called Singer Defense Systems Group and became HRB Singer for most of the Cold War. It was then acquired by a company called Hudson Corporation in 1988 and was sold to a corporate raider who in turn sold it to E-Systems of um, Dallas, Texas in 1990. And E-Systems itself was acquired by Raytheon and became Intelligence and Information and Services in 1995, merged with Raytheon Space and Airborne Systems, and today it's known as Raytheon Intelligence and Space under the parent company Raytheon Technologies. There's been a long history of academic engagement with Penn State. Um, well, first of all, there are two scholarship programs. One is called Raytheon Patriot Scholarship, and the Patriot, of course, is because uh, Raytheon uh, is the builder of the Patriot surface air missile system. And then there's the Raytheon Student Veterans of America Scholarship for veterans of any military service. Of course, there are internships with the university. And in its history, HRB sponsored uh, and endowed two chairs. One was the Singer professor, uh, professor of Signal Processing, and the other was the HRB Systems Professor. It's today located at 302 Science Park Road in State College as part of Raytheon Intelligence and Space. And let's dive into the Cold War accomplishments of this company. So the area that Raytheon uh, or rather HRB really contributed was what we call intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. They provided imagery intelligence support for the early U-2 reconnaissance program and then transition to what we call ELIN or electronic intelligence and FISN or foreign instrumentation signals intelligence. That's a mouthful of words, but uh, we know it as telemetry. And they supported CIA, the Air Force and the Navy reconnaissance programs in these areas and acquired electro optical intelligence expertise and that's like infrared. So in the early history of the U-2 program, um, the U-2 was uh, delivered to by um, Lockheed at a place called Watertown in CIA. Uh, we also know it as Station D, and you might know it as Area 51. So the early U-2 uh, once had a cover story of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, and that was an actual organization created in 1915, and that was the precursor to today's NASA. But they put that on, on uh, as an identification on the aircraft in order to give it some kind of cover. Uh, there were various electronic systems for the U-2, and they were designated using Roman numerals. And HRB, according to the deep classified documents I could find, built systems 7, 8, 10, and 17. And recently, on July, Ju July the 1st, the CIA declassified a very good documentary about the U-2 program at Area 51. And that picture shows the electronics bay of engineers and technicians installing one of the electronics packages on board the U-2. Now let's look at System 7 first. Um, it, System 7 came about when we discovered that as we were doing with the captured V-2 rockets, the Soviets were also testing V-2 rockets and we needed to collect what kind of data uh, was being transmitted by the V2 telemetry packages. Well, uh, fortunately for us, we discovered that the Russians did not change or swap out the German telemetry package since we had a copy of the V2. Uh, we knew exactly what frequencies uh, they were using. It was the same frequencies, in fact, we were using to test the V2. So we were able to develop a system seven through HRB 
It has six tuners covering different parts of the radio frequency spectrum. And back then, they can only record 12 minutes of data on each of the six tuners. So 12 times six, you have about uh, 72 minutes of data on magnetic tape. It was first deployed on a U-2 on June the 9th, 1959, and it was so successful that it was utilized in 22 other missions with the U-2. Now, system 7 was so good that the Navy got wind of it, and they wanted their own system for an aircraft they were developing for reconnaissance, and that aircraft was the Sky Warrior. Um, this led to a system 8. Some modifications were made for the Navy in order to be placed on board the Sky Warrior. System 10 was based on that very successful System 7 technology. It was designed to collect a special class of radar signals known as ABM or anti-ballistic missile radars. Uh, but the collection mission for System 10 was never carried out. And here's one of the reasons why it wasn't carried out. As you recall, U-2 was uh, shot down um, with uh, Francis Scarry's po powers as pilot on board the U-2, and after that, overflights of the Soviet Union uh, were, not, were not happening. And because the overflights would require the U-2 to fly over the test ranges the Soviets were using, uh, primarily these test ranges were uh, both at Plesetsk, uh, which is an ICBM launch facility, and another one called Kapustin Yar, which for, was for shorter range missiles. And what the Soviets were doing was for the Plesetsk to uh, Kamchatka path, which is about 5,800 kilometers or 3,600 miles, they were testing four range operational ICBMs that they were using as well. And at Kapustin Yar to Seri Shagan in Kazakhstan, uh, they were testing shorter range missiles as well as simulating what they thought are Minuteman and early ICBMs like the Atlas and the Redstone uh, would be able to do. So they were testing shorter range missiles from K, what we call KY to SS. And here is System 17, which was another attempt to uh, collect against the Soviet anti-ballistic missile radar sites at the Sarashagan Missile Test Center. And the photograph shows the triad engagement radar. And next to it, you'll see a launch tube. And this was the primary uh, anti-ballistic missile system that the uh, Russians deployed to defend Moscow with these triad radars. And we wanted to collect the signal from the triad radar as well as any telemetry that may have been emanated by these ABM interceptors under test. And System 17 expanded on System 7 by having much wider bandwidth radars with some kind of direction finding antenna capability. Now the plan was to fly U-2s in between Kazakhstan and the People's Republic of China. Uh, because at the time we knew that the Soviets could shoot down a U-2, but we didn't know whether the Chinese could shoot down a U-2. Well, we did learn that they were able to using the same system that they acquired from the Soviets. And uh, previously uh, you had a talk on the um, SA-2 missile system. And so that variant of the SA-2 used by the Chinese was successful in shooting down U-2s. And this picture shows a U-2 shot down by the Chinese. It's a Taiwan U-2 uh, flown by, on our behalf, by uh, Taiwanese pilots. Now, it, we were expecting to have a long tip-off time uh, where we would know that the Soviets were preparing to launch a missile, but the tip-off time was reduced to just one hour and we could not get a plane up there in time in order to be able to monitor any of these tests. And, but because the System 17 was so capable, uh, it was put into service on all of CIA's U-2s starting in 1966. One of the significant accomplishments by the HRB folks 
They deploy to various signals intelligence sites in Turkey. There's a site called Sinop in Turkey and also other sites on the Soviet periphery. Um, they monitored the first successful Soviet ICBM test, which occurred on August 21st, 1957. Uh, NATO called it the SS-6 Sapwood. In Russia, they call it the R-7 Simyorka. And it was a true ICBM. It had a 5,500 mile range, uh, 3.1 mile accuracy, which means that um, there's a 50-50 chance that a missile would actually hit a bullseye within that three and a half mile circle, where um, if you have 100 missiles, 50% will land within three and a half miles and 50% will miss. So that's called circular error probability and 3.1 mile back in the day was, was pretty good. And with a three megaton warhead, you didn't have to miss by much in order to uh, achieve the uh, destructive force that the Soviets were seeking. Now this R7 uh, ICBM has adapted over the years for use as a space launch vehicle. And the current adaptation of this exact um, R7 ICBM is now supporting the International Space Station. And I mentioned the era between analog to digital, which was very important. Uh, back in the day, a lot of the intercepts were recorded on analog magnetic tapes. And on the left side of the screen, you'll see a Honeywell, what we call a Honeywell 96 uh, tape recorder. And so the signals will be recorded on tape and will be played back through various hardware, such as you see here. Uh, the middle positions are like telemetry analysis, and the big blue racks are electronic intelligence or radar analysis. And all of the uh, major intelligence agencies uh, in weapons intelligence had these signals and lab analysis laboratories uh, in their various facilities, and they took up a lot of space because they had like actual physical tape recorder units, tuners, demodulators, oscilloscopes, all of the equipment you see up in the racks. Uh, they had mechanical analog patch cords which required a human operator to patch one piece of equipment to another piece of equipment in order for it to be used. And um, as far as analysis, you eyeball it basically, or print it out on thermal paper. And reams and reams of thermal paper and taking like protractors and rulers and whatnot to start measuring the signal. So that's how we did it for uh, many decades from 50s, 60s and 70s. And in 1980s, we discovered that um, digital was the way to go. And that's because we started flying satellites. Now, satellites will downlink what they collect through uh, digital links. So digital data was coming from the satellite to various ground sites. And this completely revolutionized signals analysis. HRB was one of the primary leaders in digital signals processing. And I'll stop right here. And this is the only technical part, but I, I promise you'll, you'll be able to understand this technical part. So here's the technical part, analog to digital in simplest terms. Uh, you see um, a waveform up here, analog signal. And what we did was we basically picked off and selected a series of points on that waveform. And then that's called sampling. And then a process called quantization uh, with those points picked off from the waveform, we assign arbitrary values of relative values between zero and 255 base 10. So you see the quantized values um, in this graphic. And then we took these numbers between zero and 255 base 10, and we converted them to binary format. So zero in base two or any base will be a string of zeros. And it, since it's eight bit, uh, we had eight zeros, and the value 255 will be eight ones. And so that encoding helped us because computers understand encoding. They don't understand numbers, but they do understand one uh, binary ones and zeros. Now, in order to get from an analog waveform to a digital waveform and be as accurate as possible, there's something called the Nyquist rate. And that's named after a uh, physicist named Harry Nyquist. And he worked for AT&T. 
And he discovered that in order to reproduce close to or as good as the original analog signal, we needed to sample that analog signal at twice whatever the bandwidth of the analog might have been. So in this example, you can see that we have an analog signal. And then if you undersample, don't have enough samples, uh, we don't have anything close to what the original analog looked like. So this is undersampled. And if it's properly sampled, you can see that the tops of the samples more closely resembles the analog signal. So for six megahertz, for example, six million cycles per second or six megahertz bandwidth signals, um, we required a 12 million samples per second. That is 12 million cuts at that analog signal every second that analog signal is transmitted. So going back to our original position here, there's an ELINT position that actually was at the National Security Agency and to say uh, declassify these photographs. And so you can see what we actually had. And I can say that CIA's ELINT positions were very much similar. We had a similar equipment to what you see here. But because of ones and zeros, because of the binary format of these signals, you can see in the two graphics below, we can now use computers. And instead of having racks of equipment, many, many uh, tape recorders, many, many oscilloscopes and signal generators and receivers and tuners and whatnot, uh, you can just basically use a very good computer and you can build the exact analog equipment as software-driven tools. And so you see the two graphics here of various um, actual radar signals being displayed by, a, this is a non-HRB example, an unclassified example of what a digital signal processing waveform would look like uh, using software instead of the hardware. So that's digital signal processing. And all of that was a way of introducing airborne to space. So airborne reconnaissance um, primarily was based on uh, uh, several aircraft, the Cobra Ball aircraft, Rivet Joint, and Combat Scent. And these are flown by the Air Force, uh, the 55th Wing, which is based in Offutt Air Force Base, Omaha, Nebraska. E-Systems was one of the companies that acquired HRB uh, from uh, the original owner, Hadron, and because E-Systems was a system integrator for these RC-135 aircraft, uh, by extension, then HRB, and which was now called E-Systems, uh, gained some expertise in a lot of the sensor packages on board these aircraft. And with Cobra Ball being a, um, a infrared collector, uh, they collect infrared images of Russian uh, intercontinental intercontinental ballistic missiles and their reentry vehicles uh, flying into Kamchatka. Um, the company also acquired a lot of expertise in infrared. And now we have space. Uh, most of the signals collected by the US intelligence commu community, at least strategic signals are collected from space because now we can overfly space and not worry about being shot down. So we have here on the left, a very new generation of unclassified signals intelligence satellites called Hawkeye 360. It is my understanding that the Hawkeye 360 system being unclassified and very capable um, is supporting the Ukrainian war effort because it is a commercial satellite company, not tied to any particular government. Uh, there was a series on Netflix called Pine Gap and they uh, accurately, I would say, accurately depicted what a U.S. SIGINT satellite would look like. Um, I can't say, say too much about this satellite. I will give you a hint, though. A football field would fit underneath that antenna. It is very, very large. Also, from the Pine Gap series, uh, we learned, and this is a true statement, that uh, American global power relies on the intelligence gathered by three huge satellite surveillance facilities. And you may have heard of some of them. Uh, there's one in uh, Buckley, now Buckley Space Force Base in Denver, Colorado. If you fly into the Denver International Airport, if you're flying um, in a certain um, landing uh, path, 
and sitting on this on a certain part of the aircraft, you look over and you'll see um, a facility with large white ray domes. And that is Aerospace Data Facility Colorado. It is the center of all US space-based intelligence. Everything goes to Denver. And from there, it gets distributed throughout the intelligence community and through the Department of Defense. Now, our partners in the UK, um, we built uh, another facility called um, Minwith Hill, and that is in, within partnership with the Royal Air Force of the UK in Northern England. And in the outback of Australia in a town called Alice Springs, we built another facility called Pine Gap. Now the one in Buckley Air Force Base is um, practically uh, operated jointly with just about everyone who's anyone in intelligence or military intelligence, both civilian and the Department of Defense side. So there's a lot of tenants there. Uh, with Men with Hill, it's primarily uh, the Brits with um, the National Security Agency. And in Australia, it's the Australians with the Central Intelligence Agency. So we have these Sims Intelligence Laboratories of the Five Eye Partners uh, collecting digital data now, and they were able to do some fine grain in-depth analysis. HRB as a contractor was also able to receive some of the, these data. And from their perspective, because they build both hardware and work with the Department of Defense and building hardware, um, they're better able to look at some of these signals and tie it with weapon system capabilities. And those capabilities, uh, from analysis done by the government side and the contractor side drove a lot of the Department of Defense's acquisition of weapon systems. So we knew what strengths uh, the, the adversarial weapon might have and also take advantage of vulnerabilities that they may exhibit and built it into our weapon systems to overcome the strengths and uh, take advantage of the, these vulnerabilities. And the pictures below show you uh, a fictional de depiction of what the joint defense facility at uh, in Australia might look like. And it's a very accurate depiction of mostly, mostly a lot of white ray domes. And from that series, you'll see some positions there uh, with a lot of screens. And if you go to uh, these facilities, it's basically what you see is a lot of screens um, with various depictions of signals of data coming in. Um, and then they were able to digitally record it and then transmit that digital recording to their customers, which will be us in the intelligence community. Now, I mentioned before that we had partnerships with the Brits and the Australians. Uh, HRB hosted a lot of technical analysis conference at, there at State College at their headquarters. Um, they were called periodic analysis reviews, and they were attended by signals intelligence analysts from the US, from the British government, uh, mostly the government communications headquarters or GCHQ and their Ministry of Defense and the NSA counterpart uh, in Australia, this an Australian Signals Directorate. And these PARs were held at various times during the year, focusing on certain weapon system domains, such as land-based weapons, sea-based weapons, air and space, and a special category for anti-ballistic missiles. It was an opportunity to share our analysis uh, for peer review from our counterparts, both internationally and within the US intelligence community. And it gives opportunities for contractors like HRB and other contractors invited to these technical analysis conference to show off new techniques and new tools. There are two distinguished employees I wanna highlight. One is uh, Dr. James L. McLucas. Now, he received his PhD from Penn State University in 1950 and went on to become both its vice president and technical director and eventually president of the company. And then he entered government service uh, with the Department of Defense, being the deputy director of defense research and engineering for a few years, uh, joined NATO for a few years as their assistant secretary general for scientific affairs. Now, MITRE Corporation is another federally funded research and development center and he was president of that for three, year, three years, became director of the National Reconnaissance Office, 
and then Secretary of the Air Force and concluded his government service as being the administrator for the FAA. Now, Dr. McLucas, when he was at Penn State, hired this gentleman, uh, William J. Perry. Uh, he was a doctoral candidate in math when he was attending Penn State in 1951, and he was hired on by HRB as a student employee, uh, earning his doctorate as well as working for HRB. He went on to be director of the GTE Sylvania Laboratory and later uh, founded a major laboratory called ESL or Electromagnetic Systems Laboratory for a number of years, became Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, Deputy Secretary of Defense, and ultimately Secretary of Defense. Uh, Dr. Perry is still with us, and he is now serving as Professor Emeritus at Stanford University. And basically, folks, that is the uh, presentation. It's very short and sweet. I just wanted to cover a little bit of what uh, HRB did uh, from State College, and these are the sources of the information I presented, uh, unclassified sources in order to present the information, and uh, now I'm pretty much open for questions. Wow, great. All right, well, thank you, John. That was really interesting. Um, I do have some questions uh, in the queue, actually, that I'm going to ask. Uh, there was a question about where was the U-2 flying in 1966 when you were talking about the U-2 program? Uh, it was flying on, it was used on the periphery of these countries. So we couldn't overfly, of course, the Soviet Union and we wouldn't overfly China. But from the periphery of these countries that were able to fly from various bases and our NATO partners, our partners in Scandinavia, and as also in Asia, uh, for example, the U-2s flew out of Atsugi, Japan, mm, okay. uh, the Atsugi Naval Air Station, Japan, um, and flying out from um, Pakistan, for example. And uh, at that time, uh, we had a relationship with the Iranian government through the Shah of Iran, and CIA had various ground sites there, and we also were able to fly U-2s from uh, Iran. So. Peripheral countries was uh, where uh, were where uh, the U-2s flew from. Hmm. Um, I have another question. Do joint defense facilities operate from the strategy that nuclear combat is winnable as opposed to mutually assured destruction? No, uh, the defense facilities don't even think about that. We're basically collecting signals intelligence. Um, we're basically collecting intelligence to understand how weapon systems work adversarial weapon systems. And so those are policy decisions made by policymakers, that is our elected politicians and appointed officials in the government. They make that policy, uh, but the intelligence community makes no policy whatsoever. We collect information for the policymakers so that they can make decisions and make policy. Mm. But without that information, there'd be no way to make that kind of a decision. Your talk, which was wonderful, by the way, and forgive me if I'm invisible. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. Okay. Um, in the 60s and the 70s, you uh, seem to be focused on the accelerated acquisition and massive information. That uh, information is pointless absolutely valueless unless you have a direction and somebody wants it. The only direction I can think of is from the Department of Defense, um, because this is in some ways strange love, isn't it? No, I, I disagree with that uh, assessment. Having been a weapons in, uh, intelligence analyst at CIA, uh, it's not pointless. Um, what we're doing is driving acquisition of hardware. Uh, not policy, it's hardware. So as far as how our hardware is being used, that is definitely in the purview of policymakers. But we want to provide our warfighters with the best hardware available based on what we know of what they might face on the battlefield. Uh, and so that was our intent. Now, as far as what we collect, that was driven by intelligence requirements. And those intelligence requirements came from the president. Uh, there were certain directors from the president saying, we want to focus on this area of the world. We want to focus on these threats. And so when the intelligence community get its marching orders uh, from a broad perspective like that, we turn them into actionable intelligence requirements. 
down to the nitty gritty. Like, you know, fly your satellite here, tune to this frequency and collect 20 minutes of this signal. And that's what the intelligence requirement will say. And then we will analyze that to extract from it weapon system performance of our adversaries, provide that to the uh, Department of Defense. And then they are able to acquire the weapon systems that they need in order to address what we collected and analyzed as far as performance. Uh, so as far as war fighting, uh, as the decision to go to war and what was once called a PSYOP, um, the Single Integrated Operational Plan for the uh, use of nuclear weapons, um, that was all done by like policymakers. Mm. Thank you, very insightful, appreciate it. Um, I have another question from, from the chat. Did any commercial or consumer products come to market from HRB's work? You know, for example, you know, with NASA tech transfer, you, you know, all the uh, miniaturization of uh, electronics, you know, for example, among other things. Uh, I can't point to any specific piece of gear. I can't say, oh, look at this device. It came from HRB. But generally at that time, when we were going from analog to digital, a lot of that work was done in a university by people who um, were studying uh, digital signal processing. And Penn State University, uh, for example, has one of the premier um, electrical engineering labs in the country. And they do have a signals analysis lab there uh, where they did a lot of the digital signal processing work. And that's true for just about any uh, university system uh, and academics, uh, they were looking at how to uh, deploy, uh, to create, to manufacture digital, digital systems uh, based on a lot of the pioneering work that was done. So I can't point to any particular one, but, you know, because, you know, uh, if you look at the founders of the uh, digital age, you look at Silicon Valley, um, they were all like trained in these various universities. And a lot of these universities had partnerships with the US government, with the military. And I'm, I'm sure there was some cross transfer of technology going from one to the other. Yeah. It's not necessarily the technology that's classified, it's the application of the technology that's classified. Mm. So that's why you can have a um, commercial imagery satellite uh, from Maxar Technologies, which provides all of the imagery you see, in, most of the imagery you see in Google Earth and Google Maps, you have that, that's commercial unclassified. Um, and then you have this new Hawkeye 360 signals intelligence system collecting signals that's unclassified. And they were all derived from originally classified technologies from the National Reconnaissance Office. Wow. I'm wondering, just a kind of a general question about, you know, imagery intelligence and you know back before the the digital age obviously you'd have to get those magnetic tapes from the u2 out in uh what is it watertown <laughs> to uh hrb um was that transfer via the cia or the military you know i'm just curious i don't know whether that's possible to disclose you know what the chain of command is to try to get it to hrb to be analyzed that's, that's, that's easy to say um, because uh, what happened at Area 51 was testing and development. It wasn't operational intelligence. At okay. that point, we were testing new systems and flying aircraft. And so to this day, that's what it is. It's a test facility. Uh, right now, it's being run by the Air Force, Edwards Air Force Base. Um, so we don't actually operationalize any intelligence that is flown back or downlink to Area 51. That doesn't happen. But the platforms that collect intelligence, they are uh, operated by the US military, the Navy, the Air Force, the, even the Army. So you have the uh, uniformed services operating the equipment. And uh, they are able to then um, land, if it's an aircraft, take the uh, data off the aircraft, and then uh, distribute it to who it needs to be distributed to. So I used to order uh, signals analysis. For signals analysis, I used to order magnetic tape from the Cobra Ball aircraft because they were flying over Kamchatka, near Kamchatka, collecting against uh, the Russian ICBM tests. So I would get like signals uh, that they collected, uh, and I was 
like sharing that with others because they would make duplicate duplicate copies. Um, so it's not like they're downlinking anything to uh, Area 51. And as far as satellites go, um, it's all digital downlink. As far as imagery goes today, before it was actually film. They actually took pictures on film and then had to parachute it down on a capsule and had an aircraft with big hooks on its tail end capturing that, that uh, satellite yeah. um, payload coming down from the satellite. So that was then. And they actually had physical film that they have to go through and look at. But now it's all digital downlink. Yeah. And so it's all digitized on board the spacecraft and then downlink to various ground centers um, throughout, the, throughout the world that um, our, our ally partners and uh, we ourselves operate. So I can say I'm classified. I can say that for imagery, um, that area is in Las Cruces, New Mexico, near White Sands Missile Range. So that's where the imagery comes down. And for signals, it's those three major places I discussed in the in the slide presentation at Denver, Minworth Hill, UK, and Alice Springs Pine Gap, Australia. And it's all digital. And then they can package that and then send it to where it needs to go. Yeah. I would think that, you know, the encryption requirements for that type of stuff to make sure that it's not compromised in any way um, is, is also another interesting topic of conversation. All right. Great. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, John, you, you, you talked about how the uh, on, on the on the ground side, uh, they, you went from analog uh, tape recordings to digital processing. Uh, how long did it take for the acquisition side to go to uh, digital re recording of some sort and to get away from analog tape? On the acquisition side, meaning um, when you say acquisition, I think defense acquisition that is making hardware. No, no, I, I uh, the, 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 the aircraft collecting the data. Oh, okay. Right. So it's done in real time. And as soon as they land, um, I know the, uh, the data uh, is recorded digitally and that digital um, recording is then uh, put into the United States, if it's signals, United States SIGINT system. And from there, it's just like pulling data from like, you, Netflix. I mean, when you know when you, you get uh, you want to watch a movie on Netflix, you don't have to like go to Netflix and get it. You just pull it, and so no, a lot okay. of this goes into a, a repository, an electronic repository, and from there uh, we have a file name, and so they do send out the file name saying, okay, uh, on this date at this time we recorded this system. Um, and here's the file name, so we can pull that file name, and then the recording comes with it. Okay, and how long did it take for the uh, ac for, for the acquisition platform, I'll call it, to 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 sw trans change over to, a di to digitally being able to digitally uh, acquire those signals? How, how long did it take them to to uh, get away from tape? Um, Longer. The, I, 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 you're talking I, about the actual evolution from di analog to digital. Yes, on the, in the that took in, a number of years. It mostly occurred during the eighties. Okay, and it was a hybrid during the eighties, so we had part analog and part digital. And um, through the nineties, it went almost all digital, and it's all digital. When I retired in two thousand nine, it was all digital. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. Anyone else with any questions? Hi, this is like the. Uh... As far as the photographs uh, uh, from space now, how's the quality improved since then? Uh, because uh, anybody in Hollywood say uh, film would be the best, you know, thing to watch video on uh, back in the day. And I assume with digital now, it's a lot better, at least on a home TV. But as far as, uh, again, unclassified, I mean, nothing classified, but how good as the quality improved now, pure digital. Thank you. Yes, um, before uh, we were measuring, we, we use a, um, 
a measurement known as pixels uh, per square centimeter, pixels per square centimeter. And so before uh, we would have um, like 10 centimeters of resolution from space, let's say 10 meters or 10 meters of resolution. And that means that anything within a 10 meter square, any object in it looks like one big blob. So you can have like a hundred pieces of something within 10 meters square and it looks like one big blob. All right, that was then. Um, today, it's down to centimeters. And so the folks at Maxar Technologies will sell you their best imagery at $300 million per year, 24 seven on demand. This is like Google Earth 24 seven real time on demand for $300 million a year. And Maxar can do uh, 31 centimeters per pixel, which means from 600 miles up in space, uh, just take your ruler and draw a little square, 31, centim 31 centimeters on a side, and put something in it, and you can see it from space. That's unclassified. I tell folks, I can't talk about classified, but as a rule of thumb, divide that by two, and you'll see what our capabilities are. It is extraordinary capabilities that we have now. <laughs> Wow, wow. It's a little scary too, how fine, how much resolution there is now. All right, any other questions for John while we have him? All right, well, John, this was fabulous. I really appreciate your time this evening. It was really interesting. Uh, I think I've, you know, I've seen several comments in the chat of, you know, great presentation. So it was wonderful and we'd love to have you back. So if you have uh, other topics, we'd love to uh, entertain those in 2023. So we can certainly take that offline. Sure. I can uh, definitely uh, talk to you about it. Um, I have some already, I have one already queued up. Something I mentioned before was the land-based uh, SIGINT sites that uh, we ran with various countries and I can talk about those because they're now unclassified. Okay. All right, terrific. All right, well, I think we're gonna call it a wrap uh, this evening. I appreciate your time, appreciate everybody's time and join us uh, in August for the uh, Greg Kennedy's presentation on the Corporal Missile. So thanks again, everybody. Uh, stay safe out there, enjoy the summer and um, we'll see you in August. All right, thanks so much. Thanks again, John. Good night.